Welcome, everyone, uh, for this evening. So we have uh, the, the inaugural lectures from Isma and, uh, and Martin uh, to keep us entertained for the next hour or so. Um, I just want to say a few words of introduction. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm uh, Mark French. I'm the, as uh, Paula says, I'm the pseudo-exec dean. I'm the interim exec dean uh, for BITS. Um, and, um, yeah, as I said, these are the inaugural lectures for chemistry. Um, I just want to just reflect on one thing. I think the faculty has become a really vibrant and exciting place um, over the last few years. Um, for example, this week we had, uh, yet last night we had uh, a celebration of our former dean who became a fellow of the Royal Society last week. Tonight we've got the inaugural lectures of Martin and Isma. Um, and tomorrow we have, tomorrow evening we have David Gross, um, Nobel Prize winner 2004, giving the Higgs lecture for the faculty. And that's just in one week. Um, so I think that's a sort of indication of the kind of things that's going on. Um, my role here tonight is to, um, is just to introduce uh, Isma first of all, and then Martin uh, second. So here we go, Isma. So uh, a star of chemistry. Um, 2001, um, he got his, his, uh, his uh, undergraduate degree from the University of Barcelona and then carried on to do his PhD. Um, and then after his PhD, um, moved to the States um, to uh, electrical engineering department, I was interested to find out, uh, in Arizona. Um, and he got a Marie Curie fellowship there. And then what I found really, really interesting was that after that, he got um, some European funding as a senior researcher, so European funding for reintegration. And I take that as reintegration back into society, returning from the States back to the civilized world. And he came back to the University of Catalonia. Um, and then, of course, he returned to his home territory, back to the University of Barcelona, first as an assistant professor and then as an associate professor, before coming to King's uh, with a Consolidator ERC grant in 2017. And now Isma is a, uh, is a professor of, of chemistry, and we're about to hear um, his story and um, his vision. So over to you, Isma. <coughs> Thank you, Mark, for the, um, yeah, being reintegrated into the society a little bit, long time ago. That was, that was a, good, a good thing to do. Uh, so, right, so, uh, there we go. So, I, uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone to be here in, uh, in my inaugural lecture, and I want to thank Carl for organizing all these things, so for helping me with the title, because it was quite um, difficult for me to put, like, a title that kind of, like, um, summarized my journey. That was a really hard thing to do. So, so I think it's more material big possibilities is, 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 is a way, I guess, to, to look at my, my, uh, my uh, trip to, to science. I think what, what I'm going to try to do today is, uh, is uh, so I'm going to just briefly in this 30 minutes try to, to show you my, my journey, my scientific journey that goes all the way to this uh, biomolecular electronics vision, which is the vision that we have today in our group. Right? So this is, this is going to be my, my uh, kind of uh, challenge today. So the starting point was very difficult for me, so I didn't know where to start, so I, I just put once upon a time, and then I put a picture of that guy, which you don't recognize that guy's me 150 years ago, and I was in a, I was in a, in a, in a synchrotron facility at that time, machine we did my PhD, first year PhD, machine some, some oxides on the surface I was working with, and I have a lot of energy, you can see the sparks in the eyes, right? trying to like eat everything, you know, everything, all the fundamental science of, but then when I, when I look back to that time, thinking about what, what I was moved, what, what was driven me, it wasn't really big dreams or challenges. Like I, it was not like intended to save the world or, you know, like me, you know, crack off the sustainability of it or, you know, just to cure cancer, stuff like that. It was more driven by curiosity. So I was really, really uh, into fundamental science. So I wanted to, to, to know how mechanisms or processes work. That, that was my thing. If I had to deliver something to society, it was more, this is how it works. Right? And then hopefully later on, that can be translated to something to, to impact. But that was what, for me, working and how I got the motivation to do a PhD. Now, I think today I'm, I'm, I'm still a, good def a strong defender of fundamental science. And, and I think and that's going to be my, my first recommendation for the early careers that are here. I think we, we are in times where fundamental science funding is at risk. And I think more and more, because of this economic situation, you know, 
governments and, and funders can just really walk away on, on, on from this. So, so I think we as scientists, we need to be uh, more proactive in, 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 in pushing you know, those, those, those things and, 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 and just showing how important fundamental science is. So, so when, when I was like uh, trying to find a question for me to, to chase after during the PhD, that was always clear. So when I was an undergrad, I was obsessed about how electrons move, how charts move. If there was any module called electro something, I would register for it. Electronalis, electrochemistry, electro, electronic properties of materials. That was something that, at that time, I think when I look at uh, it, I think I, I, it was more like, like an intuition rather than, than really that I know that was important. I think I learned to appreciate over the years that electron moves is just ubiquitous in, in many things that surround us. Many, 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 many things. So, so just to name some devices, you know, they, they work with, you know, moves of electrons and currents in different, you know, circuit boards to do some functionalities. Chemistry, chemistry in, it's just like a rearrangement of electrons. So you have uh, chemical reactions, electrons go from one atom to the other, and they are from different bonds, different molecules with different properties. Also sensors, in the sensing part, you can see lots of different, you know, uh, uh, sensors that work with, with, uh, with a, a signal that has to be transduced into a current and then measure some properties of uh, some analytes in, in your solutions. And what is more important, because we're going to connect to this bit later on, that will connect to this biomolecular electronics uh, picture, life. Life is a bioelectronic, bioionic device. This is what we are, right? We are a bunch of charge moves to fulfill lots of different, you know, important functions in life. And I, and I just uh, listed here some of them that you, you, you know very well, respiration, photosynthesis, even enzymatic catalysis, right? They all need charges, right, to, to function. Right. So with this scenario, this, this, this uh, dream that I have, you know, to understand this, this charge movement in, in, in different systems. So this is, this is uh, the next step was wh what is the tool that I can use, right, that is an overarching tool that can, you know, really give me some knob, some control into, into charge uh, movement. And that was clear, that was electrochemistry, right? And this is, I think, it's getting more and more appreciated in the last years, I, I, I think. So I, I got to, to see that, you know, in, in science, electrochemistry is catching a, a, a different, a different, a more important, you know, uh, role. And people are kind of appreciating what, what you can do with electrochemistry. So this is an electrochemical cell here in a very simple, simple manner. I'm not gonna explain the details of it, but I'm gonna tell you what you can do with these kind of devices. So essentially what you can do is you have a knob control, right, on the electrons that you can inject in your material, your system, right? You, you, you have an electrode here, you have a, a, a liquid environment where your reactions, your material, your life, uh, stru your living a structure, whatever you have there, you want to inject electrons, and then the electrochemistry allows you to put like energy and flow of electrons and control that very well, right? very precisely, right? So it's a, it's a very nice tool, right, to, to, to look at, the fun at this fundamental problem. And now, the first problem I, I, I looked up using this, this approach was something that you know, not many people know, so, but, but I started in, in this business, in, the, in research, by doing corrosion science. It was corrosion science. It's very difficult, different from what I'm doing right now, but it's corrosion science. And when I look back now, I, I see that, that was a, that's a good starting point, because corrosion science gave me really the tools to understand profoundly how this electrochemical system works, right? And now, my goal was to, to understand how iron, you know, a material passivates and corrodes in different, you know, media that are similar to seawater. And that was a that was a, a, a you know a good problem at, at that time. It has a, a high impact, a societal importance. So this is how how it starts. And so so just uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but what, what you can see here is that how if you this is an electrochemical signal of, of an iron electrode immersed in something similar to seawater, and if you control the potential and then the potential, the voltage, which is the, the x-axis here, right down here. You can really control the amount of oxidation at the surface very, very precisely, right? Because that's what I was doing. It's just like turning my knob, going negative, positive, and then have a very exact composition of the oxygen at the surface, right? And then I could go into, into, into looking at the properties of those oxygen and see what happens there, right? Now, in order to look at the details and the mechanisms, I thought that we need to go and see how the early stages of this process takes place, right? So, so we need to go down to the nanoscale, right? And that was another thing that I was uh, pursuing during, during my PhD. And in this, in this moment, we're talking about the, the early 2000s, right? All these scanning proof microscopes were like flourishing, right? So, so I, I was very much interested in, in learning about different scanning proof microscopes. Those microscopes, they're all based on the same principle, right? You have a, a very small probe, a tip, that comes very close to the surface of your material, your material that you are studying, and then, and then get some properties at the nanoscale from the material, right? Depending on the work you want to pursue. 
But now the most interesting came, like they say, in the 90s, where you, you know th those companies, you know, designing those those microscopes, they, they could they could make it like uh, uh, working in, in under electrochemical conditions. So I could use those scanning probe microscopes under the electrochemical conditions that I, I really was was working, you know, using in, in doing my PhD. And this is how I started, you know, getting very intense in knowing about these electrochemical and scanning probe microscopes. So what is the first thing I, I did with this? I could do well. I can. Just, you can see that the, uh, the cells are very uh, similar, this one and this one. So the only additional thing that you have is this little tip that now close to the surface, right? So you close to the surface and then can analyze whatever happens there. And the first thing I did is image what happened and the surface of my iron electron when I oxidize in this electron electrochemically, right? With the electrochemical control. I'm gonna apologize, uh, you have to apologize because the, the resolution is very bad. So this, this uh, movie comes back to 20 years ago we make it, so, so, but you can see here that when I start increasing the electrochemical potential, this oxide grows on the surface. You see this is a one by one micron square and the little grains that you see appearing there is the, the size of five, six nanometer in diameter, right? So we can determine the, uh, the mechanism of growth. So, so it grows like by nuclei on the surface and then coalescence of the, of the layers and then it goes layer by layer and we can measure how thin the layer goes, how fast, right? And how long, you know, this layer can stand there, you know, in, uh, with an applied potential. That was the, the first step. The second step was uh, what, what, can I, what, what other properties can we get with this kind of uh, scanning probe microscopes under electrochemical control? And, 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 and this is a, a very important step in my, in my PhD process. And also because I will use this, this kind of like uh, analysis later on uh, in, 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 in other systems, more complex systems. So what I did here is just I used this little tip, right? And I'm gonna put my tip very close to the surface. I'm gonna put some electrons through this oxide layer. And then I'm gonna measure the current versus voltage. Voltage is the energy of these electrons, right? And I'm gonna collect this, this kind of like characteristic that I call IVs, current versus voltage characteristics, right? The shape of these IVs on, on, on here, right, will tell me about the electronic properties of my oxides as they go growing on the surface, right? And I can follow this process from metal on the left, right, here, to an oxide that is an N-type semiconductor oxide and, and, and shows this kind of rectification behavior. And the nice idea here is that we, we, we define actually that the passivation of, the, of this iron electrode, so the fact that this iron electrode didn't corrode farther or oxidize farther is an electronic, is electronic in nature. It's just this kind of N-type semiconductor on the surface that has these characteristics that are, are blocks the current on the positive side that avoids electrons to go through and keep going with the oxidation. So that, that was the, the first thing we, we published in our, in our PhD. In my PhD, and also another, another important contribution was like establishing this technique, right? So this technique wasn't, wasn't uh, uh, established at the moment, and that was the, the, the name we coined, is an electrochemical tanning spectroscopy. So we just adapted this, this scanning probe microscopy into the electrochemical setup to do this kind of electronic spectroscopy on the surface, right? Right, so that, that's my flashy brief summary of the PhD work. Now the next, the next uh, question for me was, all right, I can grow these oxides. I can really tune the properties of these oxides with, with electrochemical, but you know, the tunability, chemical tunability is not that big, right? Because at the end of the day, I could oxidize more or less, but uh, there's not much I can do. So if I wanna control the electrical properties of my interface, what happens in my interface, I need something that is more versatile, right? And because I'm a chemist, and chemists is what we do is, we make molecules, right? So. I was thinking, well, let, let's functionalize this, these surfaces with molecules. And if I control the chemistry of my, my, my molecule, I'm gonna be able to control how the electrons are crossing. And then generate those sort of el electrical behaviors in my interface, right? So this is how I, 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 I finished my PhD and then looking for postdocs, I, I, I saw this vibrant field that was called molecular electronics. And I was like really fascinated. So this is exactly right, the remedy I was looking for. This is exactly what I was looking for. You know? So in molecular electronics field, what the, the dream of the field was, all right, so, so if we have molecules, right, and the molecules can be tuned chemically very easily, we can do uh, any molecule we want, we can just generate the, the electrical output that we want. So we could just use molecules as the electrical components in circuitry. And the dream is like, can I be like a substitution of the current silicon technology? There are many, many advantages of using molecules if we can't, right, instead of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, electronic devices that we use currently in, in, in silicon technology. So this is how I decided to move from a chemistry department, as Mark mentions, to an electronic engineering department, right? Which was a huge step for me. It was a huge change personally and also academically. Personally, I'm gonna show you just an example, and I don't want judgmental faces here, just, this, just to show you 
personally, how, how, how difficult it was for me, you know, I transformed into that thing. I, I completely recovered. I'm not, I'm not that anymore. So I went back to the European normal plain person I am right now. And, and academically, academically was, was really, really difficult as well because, you know, I remember when I was writing my, my Marie Curie, my fellowship to go there, that I used the word interdisciplinarity like 25 times, right? But the truth is, is that after my, my uh, uh, experience, right, I, I realized that we're very far still today to be really interdisciplinary. It took me a long time, right, to learn the language that electrical engineers were using, right? I learned how to learn coding, which was not very easy for me because we don't learn that in, the under, in chemistry undergrad. I had to learn how to do shaper boards and, and, and solve it and things. You know, it was, it was quite, quite shocking for chemists, right, playing chemists. But the truth is, is that at the end it worked out very nicely and that's my, my recommendation number two for the early fellows, you know, pick, pick the problem, right? And, and most importantly, pick the right approach to the problem and then go wherever it takes, because it, it takes you, because it's really, it's really what will give you, you know, the outcomes in your research, right? This has really worked out very nicely for me, and I'll show you in a minute, right? Well, this is the molecular electronics dream, and this is what we can do. We can just, like, generate molecules, different functionalities, to get different outcomes in, 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 the, in, the, in the electronic properties. So we can make variable resistance. For example, you could put this alkyne change here, and if you control on the bottom, like the, the conjugation, the double bonds here, then you can just modify, make it like more or less conductive, right? You can, you can make switch, right? You, photo switches, very typical photo switches for us, right? You can, you can use a photo switches to do an electrical switch because the open and closed form when you shine light, right, have different conductivities, and there you go, you have a photo switch there. And you can make even diodes, yeah? I'll talk about this in a minute, right? Rectifiers. Now, in this field, because we have these nanoscale ways to, to measure things, and I was uh, quite uh, an expert in this at that time, right? We could pick up one single molecule, and we can make single molecular wires. So we can pop a molecule in between two electrodes and measure this conductivity, and that opens to this field of called single molecular electronics. And you may think, if, if we think about shrinking and miniaturization of devices, this is, this is the, the first step fundamentally you need to do, and you need to understand the transport properties at this length scale, which is dominated by quantum mechanics. So we, I, I work quite, quite hard to like make those, those uh, advanced, you know, uh, you know, different modes to, to, to working modes, you know, to measure this in the molecular junction. So for example, I, I designed this kind of like, a, we call it blinking method, where we just uh, statically form a gap between the, the, the tip of my scanning for microscope and the surface, and then, and then we can wake and see how stochastically a molecule gets trapped, right? And when that happens, then you see this kind of like telegraphic noise, and we can measure lots of different electrical properties in there. Now, the last year and a half of the postdoc, was very productive, and I think it's one of the most productive uh, uh, points of our career, and I see many people, recommendation number four, for the youngsters, the last years of, of postdoc are uh, when you are more prepared to, 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 uh, to really uh, solve problems and, 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 you know, like do good science, and, and this is what happened to me, and I see very young people, you know, going, going away for, 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 uh, for positions very prematurely. So we, are, we just are throwing ideas, and then we, we created a single molecule transistor, for example. We created a, a single molecule potentiometer, which is like a, just like a mechanical device where you can modify the conductance mechanically. We even make a, a single molecule diode, and that was like a, a one of, of our, you know, landmark papers, I would say. So I'm just gonna show you very, very briefly how you design this single molecule diode. You see that chemically it's very easy. So you start with something like this. This is a resistor, right? got four benzene, benzene rings, right? This is a symmetric molecule. You connect it between the two electrodes. Now, this is, will give you a certain resistance. Now, if you, if, you, if, if you transform half of these molecules into, into this functionality, this is two bipyridines, right? Bipyridine group. So then you, know, you have a molecule that has one part of the molecule that is electron deficient, another part that is electron rich, right? And this kind of asymmetry inside the molecule will actually give you this very nice rectification behavior. But by the way, diodes are in, in any device, you have millions of diodes, right, in your device, so it's, it's part of the, uh, an essential part of the circuit, you know, in the logics, right? So now this is what we did, and I show you how this works very nicely, and this is a, this is a very example of molecular electronics, how, how chemistry, tailoring chemistry, you get the, uh, the electronic output that you want. So you start with the symmetric, the symmetric bond here, the, the ones on the left are just the, uh, the background noise in both cases, same thing, so when you connect the, uh, the, the symmetric molecule, you have something symmetric, you spread a resistor, when you connect this asymmetric well, you can see this nice rectification. So low occurring on one side, no occurring on the other. And it gets even more interesting with chemistry, you can control the direction of the diode because this is important. It's what voltage, you know, polarity you have the rectification. So it's simply just flipping this, 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 uh, this ID curve in here, right? And you can do it also by, by, by tailoring the chemistry, right? 
So here is the easy example. So you have this molecule here, and now what we do, you can see here, this S sulfurs are the one anchoring point, it's the one that form a connection with the electron. Now what we do here is just asymmetrically protect this molecule, right? And this is the beauty that comes here, is because in chemistry, the, you know, this, the protection can be very specific, so you, you get one a toxic group here, so you did protect selectively one of them, right? And then you can just connect just one side, the other is still protected, as you can see here, right? And so all these molecules will be oriented in the same way, right? And now you can, in the second step, you know, they protect the second one, and then you make the connection, right? If you control the orientation of this molecular diode, then the rectification is always pretty much 90% even more you know, on the same side, right? And you can flip it and then get the opposite, right? just by using simple chemistry. Okay. That's the dream, that's nice, but there was a problem here, a challenge in this field. There's always been, it's not my idea, everyone working in this field knew about this, and knew it was coming, is that if molecules can be very versatile, you can change the molecules, you can tune the chemistry, and you can produce any electrical behavior, but they are not very conductive. Chemistry, synthetic chemistry is not very conductive, synthetic molecules are not very conductive. You have something that have like five phenyl rings like that one in here, the conductivity here is pretty much zero. Right? And that's a problem if we want to translate this into technology, right? Because, you know, high resistance in molecules trans translate into, like, heating, you know, and losing energy, so it's not a, a good way to, to, to do, like, safe chain, right? Now, at this point, that was the, my last year of, of postdoc. I was collaborating with the chemistry department at Arizona State because, you know, I had this feeling with the chemists, so I was talking to the chemists doing a bunch of things. And one of the projects is they gave me an enzyme. That was my first contact with the protein. Big monster, you know, so the big protein, you know, with this structure. And then one day I put that protein into my nanoscale junction, and I saw that it was conductive. Right? Big conductive resistance. I was like, well, how, can, how can that be possible? This, this molecule is perhaps 10 nanometers, eight nanometers the longer that, that can be possible. So that was caught my attention into the biological electron transfer and transport field, right? Where Nature has developed some chemistry that has to be more conductive because it puts electrons, you know, very far away whenever it needed to fulfill all these functions, right? And there is like a, a lot of things that people know now about like transporting chemistry, which is like the long range, high efficiency, and exploits of a molecular chemistry. So I was fascinating. And then what I, what I, what I did, this is the beginning of my, my independent career. I, uh, we are starting to work to make a single protein junction, right? That was 2012 we published for the first time a single protein junction, so we put a, a protein between the two electrons and measure the conductivity. Uh, recommendation number four for the youngsters, you know, they say, uh, you're crazy, it's not gonna work, you know, protein's too complicated, this is never, never gonna be a, a thing. I, I think if you have the gut feeling and, and you have the experience, there's gonna be resistance from the conventionalism on the field, but you, you have to go for it, right? So to do this now, there are, there are several other groups in the world, including China and, and the US are using this. And it's very useful because it can give you a lot of information, electrical information of a protein, right? So the, the first thing we did is like, obviously we had to convince the community, right? And did a lot of different experiments to convince the community that this is possible. And then, and then one, one of the things that uh, was very reassuring was, you know, we start collaborating with a lot of computational, like Martin, and Martin will talk about this kind of like molecular dynamics in, in, in a bit. So this molecular dynamics for us, is a, is a good point to see that even if you squeeze, you know, this protein between two electrons, you know, the, the secondary structure, you know, is preserved. You know, so you can still do it. So that, that's, that's, that was very reassuring. Right? Now, the first thing we, say, we saw is that, indeed, you know, it was very conductive. So protein was a lot more conductive than, for example, more conductive than a molecule like this one. So something that is like three, four times as small array is, 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 is even less conducting than a protein. How can it be, right? So that was our thing. How can that be so conductive and so complicated? And the answer is it can't be the chemistry. It cannot be the chemistry because the chemistry, uh, it, nature can't, can't afford fancy chemistry. It has to use very abundant materials that has around. It has to use carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So it can't be the chemistry. It has to be the supramolecular structure. So it has to be these details that you see have, you know, all these holes in place and the internal uh, 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 supramolecular interactions inside the protein that funnels the electron in, in a particular direction. So we coined that term that is called supramolecular electronics. And that's what we're chasing after in our group. What we're chasing after in our group is trying to understand these supramolecular electrons, which is, I think, is key, right? To understand how, you know, charge moves in this biological material with such a high efficiency, right? And I'm just gonna show you just a few examples of what we do in our group. So we, we do protein bioengineering. So this is a work from Marta. So, so in Marta, what Marta did is like, 
is this just trans uh, changing the chemistry of the surface of the protein and then control the orientation, right? And you see how transport can be mapped out, right? The pathways can be mapped out in a, in a protein, right? Another, another uh, example, of another uh, project that we are, a more recent project, is this work on electrical bacteria. This electrical bacteria is an example of a natural molecular wire. These bacteria that can form these long pilis, sometimes they are, they are millimeter long, they can sh shuttle electrons pretty efficiently. How they do it? It's a mystery. You just break any physical law you can, you can imagine. So what we did here in this, in this kind of, uh, project is to get the building blocks that are these like little tetra, tetra uh, multi-heme proteins, right? And then measure this in our, in our generation. And what we saw actually is that a tetra, tetra uh, porphyry molecule like this one, protein like this one, like a protein, can support something that is quantum mechanical uh, tunneling through it in four nanometers, right? Quantum mechanical tunneling is, you know, usually operates in one nanometer. This is something right, quite extraordinary for a, for a chemical, for a chemical uh, backbone. Now, another project is this uh, redox enzymatic catalysis. It's an ERC project that we are really excited about. It's a work by, by, by Tracy. Uh, Tracy did a fantastic job. So what we did here is we're interested in how enzymes work. You know that proteins, enzymes, what they do is accelerate reactions, right? And they do in a manner that we cannot like uh, copy in, 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 in synthetic, in the synthetic, uh, uh, in a synthetic lab. So what we did here, what we see is like we can actually transduce or capture this enzymatic catalysis electrically with our approach, right? And I'll show you just a simple example. This is a protein that is not catalytically active, right? And if this is the moment the protein is picked up, right? It's a jumping current, and you see that the, when the protein is in the junction, while it's in the junction, the current oscillates, but it's quite silent. I'll show you the same experiment with, uh, with an enzyme that is, you know, turning over, right? What we see here is that while the enzyme is dropped, right? This is a P450 enzyme. It's, it's, it's quite a slow enzyme, but you can see this kind of a spikes, right? That we think, uh, you know, they're, they're relating to the catalytic activity of the enzyme. And just to be reassured of that, so if we, if we do the same experiment in a, in a much faster enzyme like this glutathione reductase, what we see is something even more spiky, so high frequency, right? So we can, this is the first time we are relating electrical transduction from uh, an enzymatic catalysis. And this is what I, what, I, what I mentioned before earlier with, you know, doing fundamental science. So this is a fundamental project that if we can realize this into a device, we'll be really, really uh, breaking through revolutionaries, how, how to measure, you know, uh, electrical catalysis electrically will give us a throughput, miniaturization, and, 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 and high level, uh, uh, low level of, of detection, right, for this particular, you know, uh, sensing process. I think I'm gonna skip that because I think I, I run out of time, probably. So I'm gonna skip this this part. So this is just a, a concept that we, uh, we uh, our group uh, is a landmark. So it's, it's, it's a concept called electrostatic catalysis. And the reason why I put it here is because this is the reason why we started using enzymes. So enzymes are thought to use electros uh, electrostatic fields, electric fields, right, inside the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the active site to catalyze reaction, right? And we demonstrate this with our, with our uh, uh, nanoscale approach. In here, we have a, a dl other reaction, for example, this is in dl other reaction, you have this dyne, the anophel, and they click together. And what we did here in this particular uh, experiment is that we put one reactant on top, another one on the bottom, and then we, we approach them together, and then we apply an electric field. And what we see is, is actually, just to make the long story short, is that the electric field actually is accelerating the reaction like by, by six fold, right? And only accelerate the reaction when it's one polarity, not the other. And that has to do with the stabilization of the transition state, right? So this is just a first demonstration that the electric fields actually can catalyze the reaction. That could be a way of, uh, of to explain the enzymatic mechanism. Uh, I think we're gonna skip this part and then go to acknowledgements. And uh, I can't thank enough people. Here in, in, in just one slide. So the first is funders. Funders obviously, you know, give in the morning, so they uh, they allow me to do the research. And for me, a central part of, of my life is family. So this, uh, I always see, uh, you know, when I tell the the, the, the youngster, I always see the, the early career researchers. Oh, it's sometimes it's very I struggle, you know, to combine my family life with with research. You know, and I get where they're coming from. But I think in the long run, it's the opposite. I mean, the academic career is like kind of like a marathon. So you need someone to cheer you up for a long time next to you, otherwise you won't make it, right? So I think in that case, that works for me. I think I had to thank my family for the constant support. Also, I need to honor a couple of people here that they both, uh, this, uh, this Fausto and, and Nonjan, they're like the, my PhD advisor from uh, Fausto and my postdoc advisor in Nonjan, they both passed away during, during COVID, like a two months uh, uh, difference in time, but I, I, I needed to honor them somehow, so I thought that that would be the place to, to talk about them. So I think these, these people transform what, what the way I think about science, 
you know, Nonjan, I have a lot of collaboration and, and, and I really picked up on him, you know, being creative and brave, you know, and trying to, to push myself into, into new ideas. I think I need to help him uh, a lot of, of, of what I'm doing right now. And also group members, group members, obviously, without them, I can't do the science, so, so they are, and I need to thank them and, and also to, to follow me with this, all these crazy ideas, right? to have the patience for it. And collaborators, I can't put all the collaborators here just simply because the list is, is huge. But when I was thinking about collaborators, it's this, this guy that really, it really makes a difference in my career. It's Mikkel Samenut at UC Berkeley. He's a, he's a scanning probe microscope uh, specialist, and he's the person that really, really puts me in, in, into, in, another, in another level in, in, in all these scanning probe microscopies and then allows me to like, push the boundaries on these techniques, etc. Now, I, I'm finished here, just saying that, remember that we have a sparking idea coming up from your brain, right? This idea, surely, will be powered by a flow of electrons going through your system. Thank you so much. Okay, so <coughs> I probably get the best job because I get to do the vote of thanks, um, which is probably fitting because I'm actually responsible for both Isma and Martin, really. Um, so to give some context um, for both of them, because I have to do two vote of thanks, which is even more exciting. So, I mean, most of you know that over the past few years, Kings have really been reinvigorating their science and engineering. And we had this enviable position, central London, it was all quite exciting, pre-Brexit, I'll add. Um, great university, prestigious history. And chemistry in particular was undergoing a major renaissance. Uh, we had the opportunity to kind of start from scratch, but had all the history behind us. And it, this wouldn't really have been possible without people like Martin and Isma, actually. Um, and so what we had to do was we had to find people um, who were perhaps foolish enough to join us, but obviously you didn't tell them that. You told them they were really talented, they had all these new ideas for chemistry, and you know they had to kind of join us on a promise, you know, it's a university space was going to happen, we were going to get nice buildings in central London, they would be able to afford to live here. You know, I had to go through this, this uh, tale. <laughs> and, y you know, you've heard Isma and you heard Martin soon, and I mean, th they could go anywhere, right? So there's stiff competition. So Isma's, um, you know, someone that um, I managed to lure from sunnier climes. In my defense, I didn't at the time know about his hunting desires and gun-toting ability, right? That, he'd kept that quiet. I thought he was just, you know, from Catholic, you know, near Barcelona. And I thought, well, maybe there'll be some trips to Barcelona, so this is a good bet. And so he's joined us. Um, there was quite a lot of convincing he'd be able to live in London, and it was a nice city. I still haven't got him to a tapas bar to show him that we're really genuinely civilized. Um, but we've made him at home in the building because the temperatures in the building certainly remind him of probably the current heat wave um, back home in Barcelona. Um, and Isma is, is actually a really cool, great colleague. He's, he's, he's just remarkably undemanding. He had these crazy demands for his lab, and I thought, oh, how on earth are we going to do that? And then he just told me he was going to hang something in the lab and it would all be vibration free and it would be no problem, so I just nodded. It took a while. We won't go into the details of King's University. It took a while for his lab to be ready. But Isma being Isma was promoted twice before he even joined us. That's the kind of person I was recruiting. At this point, I thought, well, this is good. I mean, this man is going, you know, he's unstoppable. Um, and then, of course, when he did eventually come and join us, he became professor. And there are many sort of hidden talents of, of Isma, so he found himself thrust into academic leadership pretty soon. So he's our sort of uh, research czar, formerly probably has a title, deputy head research or something. And then, of course, he ended up dealing with the pandemic. He was, he was just a hero. I mean... We reopened, like, first in King's, first in the faculty. Isma was the man on the ground. He had everything running. He was super organized. It, it was just quite incredible. So 
we owe him a massive thanks. Everyone in the department owes him the thanks just for being able to do their research. He was incredibly sensible about it. Believe me, he cuts through any red tape and paperwork where he can. It's brilliant. I love it. You've heard his science. It's really, really cool. Um, you can see that, you know, the bet I took on ISMA was, was well placed. We know we're in, we've got a great future ahead of us. It's incredibly cool stuff. I just, I, I just really love it. And um, this is the direction, you know, he's going to be taking us in. So please join me in thanking Isma for coming to join us. <laughs> and now I hand back to our exemplary executive team. Okay, Martin, so you've got a hard act to follow, I think. Um, so, um, so it's my pleasure then to introduce Martin, so um, tell you a little bit about Martin. So Martin um, started off life as a physicist at Oxford um, and uh, stayed at Oxford, did a DPhil in uh, molecular uh, biophysics. And then he had a load of fellowships and he went to Bangalore, he went to the University of Rome La Sapienza, he went to Oxford, he went back to Oxford, he went to Utrecht. He went to the University of California, Irvine, and he went to Birkbeck, and eventually um, he landed up at John Hopkins where he was an assistant uh, prop. Um, and then, uh, fortunately, he um, also saw the light and returned uh, to the UK and first a reader at King's in 2017 and now a professor. Um, so Martin is, is a professor of chemistry, but he's also uh, recently become the, the head of department. And amongst Martin's many talents um, as head of department, he's also turned uh, Britannia House into a furniture store. Um, so uh, he's used the opportunity to, to bring lots of family furniture and install it across the department, much to the uh, pleasure, frustration, um, and comments of your colleagues. But uh, there you go. Um, so Martin, it's a great pleasure to introduce you and to invite you to give your inaugural lecture. <coughs> Thank you, Mark, for, for the introduction. And um, yes, I, I, uh, my wife hated that piece of furniture so much that she said it has to go into my office. So um, that's where it is right now. Oops, these are moving automatically. So um, my, my background, basically this slide summarizes my, my vision when I started out. I'm basically gonna start at the postdoc uh, level because in the PhD, I'll come back to that. The technology really wasn't quite <coughs> there yet to, to do the things I wanted to do, which is to sort of make design a little peptide, make it fold into a membrane and make a channel, something that really should be quite simple to do, right? So coming from physics, in physics you have laws and these laws are generally tend to be quite simple and they transcend vast scales and time and space and sort of you apply them and you put them together and you build quite complex system and you can predict them. Uh, predict them. So these are, I promise, the only equations in the talk. But it's just to show, oops, it's moving automatically. There are these are show, uh, just to show if, you're, uh, if you know equations, these are actually quite simple. So these are simple laws, how bonds vibrate and angles vibrate and so harmonic potentials, so like a spring in your clock. Uh, and then you have Coulomb and, and Van der Waals down here. I think we have, find that. oh yeah, we have it down here. So what you do is um, you calculate, um, sorry, you, you, the most important thing are these parameters here. This is important. This is fancifully called a force field. And a force field is basically the chemical parameterization. So it's like the bond width and how, how the spring constant works. And um, sorry, this is moving automatically. Uh, uh, and, and if you get these wrong, you get the wrong structures. If you get them right, you're gonna get the right structure. So the, this, I'll come back to this in a bit. So you calculate the force on any atom in the system due to all the other atoms in the system. You calculate Newton's laws and you get a molecular movement. So you're basically 17th century physics and the idea was, let's apply this to biology. You know, should we, we can predict life and we can predict how organisms work and so on. That was the, the very, very naive idea. The first thing that sort of dawned upon me in my PhD was life scans quite a lot of scale. So you have in physical dimensions, maybe 10 to the 12 orders of magnitude, that's the green bit here. And, and in, uh, in time, it's even longer. So you can have something like a bond vibration. And I think the oldest 
living organism on Earth is over 10,000 years old. It's a plant anyway. Um, and so if you want to study this kind of thing, you need enormous amount of data. So you can't really do that. If you multiply these two orders of magnitude together, then there's no computer in the world that can hold that kind of data, even for one press. So, so the second thing, though, and this is, I think, the thing I, I, I also started to slowly appreciate in my PhD when I switched from, from physics to biochemistry, really, or biophysics, is how complicated life really is. I mean, this, sorry, this is a cartoon of a cell. It's a cartoon. But you can already see it's really complicated. There's a lot of stuff in there. And God knows what it all does, right? But, and then if you zoom in, say, in this little membrane around it on the outside, this is what this looks like. So this is actually a, a molecular movie because that's the only way you can visualize this. And this is completely simplified. There's one little lipid in there. These things are made out of lipids, these membranes. Water at the top and the lipids in the middle. And, and there's thousands of different lipids in, in a normal cell. So these are really complicated, and that drives the problem. So, and then obviously the cell doesn't just have a membrane, but it needs to communicate with the outside. So it does this with proteins or channels, like Bonnie's sitting here, she's got some iron channels. And, and I'm gonna talk mostly about these membrane active peptides here, uh, because the goal was to make it one and then fold it into a membrane, do something useful. So just a little bit background, because I know it's enemy X, so it's uh, engineers, so maybe you might not know what a, what a protein is. So uh, our basically, our proteins are encoded on the DNA, and you can write them down as a letter code. There's 20 letters in this code, so this is a little membrane active peptide. They form a chain, so that the lines are drawn, sorry, from, from a moving parts and plates. And you have 20 types. And this, again, is your cartoon representations. You can make even prettier cartoons where they're sort of structural. This is, again, a simplification, but it shows sort of a semi-atomic structure of the things. A few things are shown at atomic detail. The rest is just a trace. And this here is what the goal, right? The goal is a functional protein or a little peptide you design in the computer and you maximize it and you make it do something useful, diagnostic or therapeutic or something. So this was the noughties when I started uh, and, and I got a Wellcome Trust fellowship to go Bangalore, Rome and then back to Oxford with this. And then the noughties computers were, were good but there was single core and multi-core architectures were really expensive. And you basically, if you build a system like this here, uh, uh, you know, which is small, it's 100,000 atoms. You couldn't really do that. You could do a few nanoseconds of that, and then you'd run out of, out of time. So the idea was, let's make this really simpler, right? Let's make some simple system. Let's lose the physics background. And here, this is the sort of mercy slide. This is just to show it's, it's complicated. It's not that complicated, but it's complicated. And here's a, a pretty picture at the end to show it, it does work, right? And, and it looks pretty. Um, um, and with that, sort of in 2005, uh, I managed to sort of fold up peptides, and the remarkable thing is it even gets the correct structure. It doesn't depend on the initial position. You can span it across the implicit membrane or put it in the solution. It'll go in, it'll fold up, and it gets the correct structure. So I thought, okay, fantastic. I put the champagne in the fridge, and we do assembly next, and we're in business. And then, obviously, that didn't work at all. And th the reason why this doesn't work is that a membrane is a really complicated thing. They can bend, they have different lipids, they have, they have all sorts of properties, like they have defects, and these are actually turn out to be really essential for folding a, a functionally correct structure. And building all that complexity into an implicit model, you basically lose the benefit that's shown up here. It'll be just as computationally expensive. Another thing then, so we moved on to um, explicit simulations where you simulate all the atoms, and basically, this is the time when the multi-core architectures came out. So you suddenly had two, two to four cores in a chip, and you could buy laptop chips, and they had very low power. So you build a little cluster in my dad's office. I tried to hunt down a picture, but I wasn't successful. And, uh, and we exploited the fact that he never looks at the electricity bill. Um, and this ran for three years. So this was the longest simulation at the time. And it shows your peptide, the one I've shown before, and it goes into the membrane and does all sorts of stuff. And it looks very pretty, and it took a really long time, but unfortunately, it's wrong. This is a sign of a broken phosphate. Wrong parameters give you wrong structures. So, for example, you should never have an unfolded structure like this in a membrane. It does not exist. Okay? So, so we had to go back and do something that is akin to career suicide, which is fixing a force field. So a lot of work takes a very, very long time. At the end, everybody rings you up and saying, can I have your parameters, please? 
Well, you get one paper after two years and everybody else applies it and gets five a year. So anyway, we did it anyway. This was with my twin brother, um, um, who's also working in the same field. And just to show you here, this is a fluid system. You can see a lot of it's ordered water at the top, the lipids here. And this is a frozen bilayer. And this is the correct phase transition. So experimentally, you can do the same thing. Uh, and in fact, here, it, just to show you, this is density of this system. The experimental line is in blue. The simulations are these red dots after many, many steps of iterate, iteration. Uh, so you can get this really very, very accurate. Uh, it's a lot of work, but you can do it. And once you do that, and this is just to show, it's also for Bonnie here, I started doing experiments around that time just to equilibrate systems and find out what actually does. This is circular dichroism spectroscopy. Um, so after that time, you, we realized you, it does actually work. Let's see if this movie plays. Oh, hang on. How do I switch to? Uh, uh, help. <laughs> how do I switch to a cursor? Does anybody know? Do you know how to switch this to a cursor? This is, this is why I gave up computational work, because I can't handle a computer. Uh, oh, well. Is my sound okay? Good. So thank you, uh, Isma. Um, this is folding of a peptide correctly, all atom. It took about ten years to get there from the first vision. Um, we. I also then went on and did things like partitioning. So this is peptides bobbing in and out of a membrane. Um, I designed a whole family of peptides. This was in California at the time. I had a Marie Curie fellowship to work there with Stephen White. And then before going back to, to Berkford with Bonnie Wallace. And, and here, just to show these, this behavior that you see here on an atomic detail, and this is really unique because there's no other method that can give you that kind of atomic detail insight, is very accurate. And these experiments are very complicated. In fact, making these peptides took over a year. But um, you, you sort of ring up a supplier and they'll send you an email back saying, no, you do that yourself. Um, uh, which I did. But anyway, we, we got the peptides, we got the experiments at the end, and this is just to show it's really remarkably accurate. Okay? So with that, we, uh, we, I came to uh, Johns Hopkins, um, uh, my first faculty position, and there the idea was now I've got all the tools and I know they work, and now we can try this to do, to say, find out something useful. And, and basically the question at the time was how do antimicrobial peptides work? So up here is our, this is CDC data from the United States, this is mortality. So around 1900, half the mortality roughly came from infectious disease. And then you see sort of until the, until the mid 1930s, this goes down, it's mostly hygiene. That spike here is the Spanish flu. Um, and, and then in the 40s, you have this drop here down to almost nothing, and that is the age of antibiotics, really. This, this was antibiotic driven from around here. Um, the, the thing though is we all know antibiotics are heavily overused, and they're slowly losing uh, slowly, rapidly, some, in some cases, losing activity. So we need new tools. And they're not being developed because it economically actually doesn't make any sense for companies to develop it because the current ones are so cheap, they're going to be used in the first line. You'll never make your money back if you develop the drug. So there is something else which is on all of our skins, it's in every organism in life, and these are called antimicrobial peptides. So the, the most studied ones are in these very cute little frogs, like this one here from Australia. And this makes a peptide called Mactilatin, and this thing has no potent antimicrobial activity. Um, and so what nobody knew, though, is how do these things porate membranes? How do they work? So we did simulations. These ran for over two years on a, on a massive supercomputer in Shanghai, uh, courtesy to my brother. Uh, and here, here are the channels this forms. And this was really a surprise. This doesn't just form one structure. It forms an ensemble of structures which explains why these peptides over sort of millions of years don't really um, lose ef effectivity against bugs because a bug would have to find a way to block all of these channels uh, to survive. Um, uh, and yeah, so we did that. Then the next step was, okay, we, we've, we've shown also we can do aggregation and we can predict structures. Now can we, can we design it? So uh, I start, uh, when I started at Johns Hopkins, I had a very talented PhD student, Charles, and he, he went to start to work on that. So he designed an antimicrobial library pretty much from scratch. This is just to show this is the whole library. Each dot is a peptide. 
And the idea here is you test, does it parade a bacterium or does it parade, say, a red blood cell, your own cells? And where you want to be is kind of up here, so it kills the bacterium and leaves your own cells alone. And uh, we, we showed, we find some leads here in this big library and we got a patent on this. But if you, if you look at the, uh, if you know anything about these mean inhibitory concentrations here, so that's the co mean concentration of your peptide you need to kill the cell. These are micromolar, and that is terrible. So, so if you take your amoxicillin, uh, basically it's about 10,000 times more powerful than this peptide, right? So we thought, well, okay, good. We'll, we'll work on something else. That's when the move to Kings came along, and, and uh, we had a lot of, Charles was very, um, uh, in endeavoring, and he basically realized we have a lot of cancer cells in the cell culture lab. So he tried it out, uh, um, and with a, with a PI was there at the time, and he tested it on cancer. But first, cancer is an enormous problem. It is the second leading cause of death in the world. Nine million deaths a year is almost certainly an underestimate. There's about 130,000 deaths in the UK alone. So that's like a COVID pandemic going on permanently, right? And there's cancers that are more treatable, like breast and colorectal, even these have very high mortality still, but they're kind of treatable. And then the cancers like pancreatic cancer, they're really basically untreatable, okay? Um, so the idea was, can we design a peptide to parade a cancer cell and leave your own cells alone? Because the drawback with chemotherapies is basically they're extremely toxic for chemicula. So we did that, I'm gonna spare you all the detail, um, but just to show you these beautiful simulation cartoons, this is our lead compound here and it shows it makes a nice little pore in a cancer cell membrane. Um, and then we did a screen on that, so this is experimental now, so you screen healthy cells versus cancerous cells, and you see where they kill these cells, right? And basically, this is the IC50, so the mean inhibitory concentration, you wanna be up here, because that means it kills, it, uh, you need a very high concentration to kill your own cell, but almost nothing to kill a cancer cell. So these are, these are the kind of leads. If you're on the diagonal, then basically it kills your own, your healthy cells just as much as it kills your cancer cells. Um, so we got that lead, and then here, this is the only sort of technical slide about that, just because it's a nice story. If you have a current chemotherapeutic, let's say you have cancer, like my cousin had cancer, he got doxorubicin last year, he survived, and, uh, um, and he's well. So he got this drug here. This is a standard of care in the clinic at the moment. And if you look down here, it doesn't actually kill all cells. 15 to 25% of cells survive, typically. And this is in cell culture. It's also probably the same in your organism, right? Um, these peptides here, they need a higher concentration, but they kill all the cells. So they don't care if it's a quiescent cell or which stage of the cell cycle, it kill all cancer cells, irrespective. The other thing is if you put your drug on the cancer cell a long, long time, in this case here a month, it still kills it just as efficiently. While with the chemotherapy, you, you get resistance. Even after 10 days, you shift to try an order of magnitude. So you need 10 times more drugs and even more cells survive. So this is a, a massive improvement of, over the standard of care. Um, and that basically, we thought, okay, maybe we can push this to actually be a, be a drug or something. So, so the first step, though, is if you go to a pharma company and say, I've got this peptide, and you don't need to speak anything else after that sentence. They're immediately closed for business because the thing is never gonna work. You're never gonna get this into the body. You're never gonna get this through the regulations. So Charles again thought, well, okay, let's nanoformulate this. He went to Taiwan to a collaborator and he made these nano carriers. So these are little 20 nanometer balls that are intravenously delivered. They're biocompatible. So all the ingredients are FDA approved. Uh, and here are Cal, a student in my lab, she made this very beautiful coarse grain simulation of this. So the idea is here's your ball, here it is, it goes on the cancer cell membrane, it delivers the cargo peptide that porates the membrane and so on. So with that, you had a peptide plus a carrier that makes it translationally relevant, meaning you can actually push this from the bench into the, into the clinic. And that's where I got in touch with um, IPN licensing at King's. And I have to really say King's, has an absolutely extraordinary IP and licensing department. They do fantastic work. Salma pushed this from a very early stage, and Mike Shaw is the, the head of IP and licensing. And, and basically, they found an investor at this really, uh, I mean, this is very preliminary data, right? This is really pr very preclinical. But they found an investor, and they founded a spin-out last year, Cytolytics, 
with, which has the task to, and it's going to be quite expensive, to push this to a phase one, okay? So meaning first in man trial. So I didn't just work on cancer, and I had to get this one in, because at some point when I was fixing systems, and we were driving through the desert in California, and it was a long drive, uh, my wife, Aisha here, who did her undergraduate and PhD in the chemistry department in his previous incarnation at King's, she said, why don't you do something useful? You know, like you, you were doing all this stuff, but is it really useful? Look, and, and she works on, dem on dementia. So she's been working on Alzheimer's disease. It's, I think now, dementia is now the leading cause of death in the UK for both men and women. At least for women it is. For men it might just be about the leading cause as well. Uh, uh, the diagnosis is you have these amyloid plaques in your brain. That's a definitive uh, diagnosis. And if you've read the news the last couple of weeks, there is actually now antibodies for the first time that seem to show effect. So in that case, they reduce the cognitive, the rate of cognitive decline, but they're not curative, uh, and they definitely can't prevent it. So the idea here was, uh, can you make something that's a compound that's maybe, say, preventative or treatment-wise? And, uh, and I, I'm not going to show you the details because I haven't protected it yet, but the idea is it's another peptide, and it goes on a membrane, and it's targeted, and here is the data. So this is your amyloid beta concentration. Here is your peptide compound, and you can basically knock it down. So this would be a, a, a treatment option where you give people uh, this, this peptide, which, of course, still needs to be formulated correctly, and we need to improve it a little bit. It's not that good yet. Um, but if you could give that, it would basically prevent amyloid beta buildup uh, as a start. It would be a potential treatment option. So with that... I just want to wrap up saying, where is all this going? This is all simulation-guided design, really. So we use the computers kind of to load the dice, to get information, get atomic detail, design things. So this, this is the journey of computer simulations. Why, uh, you know, from I did my PhD, uh, finished it in 2002. And in Mark Sansom's lab, where I was, he invented the term extended molecular dynamics, which is great salesmanship, I think, because it, nothing really happened. I mean, everybody got very excited about a nanosecond, and the molecule wobbled a little bit, but you couldn't really even see very much going on at all. Then, then you have these multi-core architectures coming on, so by the sort of 10 years later, you can do folding partitioning. And, and basically, this now with graphics cards and ever more cores in the chip, you can do assembly, and the next thing clearly is going to be function. And I, I, I'm, I haven't talked about this today. We did some function with, with Bonnie Wallace on ion channels, and we showed using this Anton chip here, which is a special chip built made by a billionaire in New York, and he is 100 times faster per CPU than, than an Intel chip. So we could do some, uh, some functional things, and they were also remarkably accurate. Um, but basically, this will be available in the next 10 to 20 years, and you'll be able to simulate probably up to a second, at which point a vast amount of biology and medicine becomes simulatable uh, and, and amenable to this kind of design technique. And then I just want to wrap up saying the most important thing as a scientist is you have a lab, and these are inspiring, and they work, and I, God knows why they pick you as a supervisor, because I'm always ill, and, uh, and I've got head of department as well, so I have very little time. But they are a fantastic lab, and I've been extraordinarily lucky with all the students I've ever had and postdocs. They're all amazing, so they all do fantastic work here, working on cancer, dementia, methodology development, and so on. So they, I think most of them are here. Thank you for being here as well. Um, and finally, the Department of Chemistry. So Paula uh, mentioned she recruited me to come to uh, King's, and this was more sort of a move my, you know, basically my wife didn't like Baltimore very much, and I can't blame her. It's a pretty dreadful city, even though it's a fantastic university, John Hopkins. But London is definitely a very nice city, and King's is a lovely place to be. So the history was, you know, to, at 1829, Daniel f basically founded it as the first professor of chemistry, and, and Rosalind Franklin did the famous image uh, in the 50s. And then King's shut, and in 2012, Roger Morris, who's here, and Phil Blower had the vision to relaunch it, uh, and realizing chemistry is really important. It's a very, very important discipline. You need it for medical devices. You need it for making drugs. You need it for almost everything. Everything we touch is a chemical molecule that's somehow been engineered and designed and, or used. Uh, so they had the vision to refound it, and the smartest thing they did was to recruit Paula 
as the head of the department because she completely reimagined what a new modern chemistry department looks like and she also knows how to twist arms uh, to get you to count. So anyway, and then with just 18 academics on the Polar's watch, uh, chemistry department came fifth in the West and it's been growing very steadily. This is our building, which is bursting at the seams and falling apart. Mark French knows all about this. I'm not gonna talk about that. But with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and thank you all for your attention. I just wanna say, mentors are really important for your career. And I've been very lucky. I stumbled upon Stephen White in Irvine and Bonnie Wallace, who've been fantastic mentors throughout my career. Talina was a colleague in Johns Hopkins who took me under her wings. And then Paula and Roger here at King's. It's been really fantastic. And, and the list, this is like a rudimentary list of collaborators. But these are probably the most important ones right now. And then obviously Fania and computers. And thank you very much. So it's me again. <laughs> um, so yes, it's a vote of thanks for Martin. So I work in a moderate related area to Martin and I'd been a real admirer of his work for, for a very long time. And then I got wind that, you know, he didn't want to necessarily make America great again. And he was thinking of leaving the States. And so I thought, oh, this is a good opportunity because we really needed someone who did computational things. And I was really after someone who did computational and wet experiments, and they're a rare breed. Um, but I was a bit worried because I thought, oh, gosh, he's one of these computational people and they always want these big supercomputers and mm, I don't know how kings are going to fare there. I also was a bit worried because he's quite well travelled and he talks about Rome a lot and I thought, mm, what's he going to think of London? Maybe he wants to go back to Germany. Maybe he's going to be lured to the spires of Oxford again. But actually, he was a pushover. Took him for lunch by Tower Bridge. I mean, cheap lunch as well. I mean, nothing fancy. And he was like saying yes before anything had happened. And I was like, whoa, 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 you know, we have to, you know, advertise an interview, Martin. This isn't Oxford. You know, we do things properly. Um, but anyway, miraculously, we suddenly had a position that happened to be in his area. And he came and joined us. And as he's indicated, he was right not to go to Oxford because we beat them by, you know, two decimal points on our grade point average or whatever, but who cares? Um, and as he's pointed out, you know, we're like minuscule for a chemistry department, so it was really cool. And, you know, Martin's work is brilliant, right? And he, he's just going from strength to strength. I mean, he hasn't really given you, uh, you know, told you how great that peptide and cancer stuff is. I mean, it is revolutionary. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and, and, you know, he really is doing clearly what his wife told him. He is trying to do things for the greater good now. Um, and he, he's actually that kind of person. I mean, he's, he's just so nice. He's very modest. He's very, uh, you know, altruistic. He's lovely. He can deliver awful news to people. He can do all sorts of things. So before he knew it, he was head of department, right? Because someone had to be head. So Martin's head, I don't think he quite realized that, even when he was being interviewed and accepting it, he still didn't really think he was head of department, but he is. So with Martin at the helm, you know, we're obviously really well placed. Um, we're people like Isma. Um, I don't do anything anymore because I don't have to, because I have these two people, so I just leave it to them and nod. And, you know, I think it's not just kings that should be grateful in the department but it's chemistry as a subject because they really are going to take the subject to all these new places and they're going to keep putting kings and london and the uk on the map in this kind of area so let's thank martin for his talk but also what he's going to do for us <laughs> and we get the executive dean again Thank you, Paula. Um, so I just wanted to very, very briefly say, um, yeah, what a, what a pleasure it's been this evening. Um, uh, not just to the people in the room, but also thank you um, to uh, the group of people who are, are watching this online. Um, so 
uh, Martin and Ismer, it's, um, it's been a real pleasure to, to hear your, your, your science and also, also your journey that, that, that has taken you here. Um, you also scrub up quite well. I was quite surprised. So, you know, you learned something interesting. So, so Martin, you're, you know, you're a sort of, a, um, you know, a furniture store man, but um, also, you know, you're a very fine scientist, and it's, and I think it's a real honour for Kings to have you um, as a professor here, but also in your sterling work as a head of department, um, which you were hoodwinked into doing, no doubt. Um, and 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 Isma, you know. I've learned that you're a gun-toting cowboy. I didn't know that before, but um, also, you know, the inaugural lectures are here to celebrate your fine science, and and uh, and I think it's it's a remarkable, a remarkable uh, story to hear as well. So, it's an inaugural lecture, so the tradition is that we don't have any Q and A, formal Q and A, but there are drinks at the back, and that's really your opportunity to to get Martin um, and Isma and ask them all the scientific and other questions that you want to ask them. But let's give them a big round of applause for an excellent interview. Thank you. Thank you.